It's the Bird Emergency. I'm Grant Williams. I am a bird nerd. And uh, if you're a follower of the Bird Emergency, you will know that we've done a couple of episodes where we've talked about using soundscapes, recordings of the natural environment to aid in research in seabirds and with glossy black cockatoos. Oh, and the and the Albert Liebert as well. So it's a technique that's being used a lot in conservation. And today we're going to talk to Dr. David Watts, who is at CSU, about an idea. I think that's how we'll formulate it, an idea about how we can get a better bang for the buck when it comes to conservation and re-establishment of denuded habitat. I think that's probably a good way to, to frame it. Hi, David. How are you? Thanks for coming into the Bird Emergency. Good morning. Great to be here. If you're a follower of mine on Twitter, you may have seen Dr. Dave, the Dr. Dave account on Twitter, and David's been doing an irregular series, shall we say, an opportunistic series based on whatever birds have popped in to his hood, and he's been identifying the the calls and telling us a bit about them. So, Dave, are you a certified bird nerd? Oh, I can't carry him. Yes, bird nerd from way back, and I'm that much of a bird nerd, I even teach fellow bird nerds how to be more nerdy. Now, just before we dive into your latest paper, which is why I hit you up and said, get on the show. Are you one of the folk teaching ornithology at... at That's right. Okay. Yep. So I'm a professor of ecology at Charles Sturt, and I've been teaching the bird course there since I started about 21 years ago. So it's the graduate certificate, graduate diploma of ornithology taught by distance. It's the only degree-based course in ornithology in the known universe. So it's if you, if you want to take your bird nerdy to the next level, come and say hello. Okay, well, I've got you I've got you here. This is going to save me a phone call to the university. For someone like me, Dave, that's got an applied science qualification that I took before a degree in my field was available and with like a humanities qualification as well. Can someone like me, I mean, my qualifications in horticulture, can I enrol in that course or does my not having a biology or, or physics or chemistry qualification or block me from becoming an ornithologist? Good question. And you're free to apply. So the way it works, it is a postgraduate degree. So we do ask that though it is, for the most part, it is for students that have a previous degree, not necessarily in the sciences, not necessarily in the biological sciences. If you're not sure, if we're not sure, what some students elect to do is they take one subject. It's like, look, let's just try this out. And that's really as much for you as it is for us. Yes. And that gets you into the swing of things for many potential students. It's been a while since they've studied. So it's sometimes just getting back into the back on the horse, as it were. And if you're happy and it's working, then we can just tick a few boxes and you're in. So yes, we take people from a wide variety of backgrounds. We do recognize that there are many ways to acquire knowledge. Degrees, completing degrees is just one of those. If you're not sure, go through to the enrollments people, the good people. If there's any questions, it'll come back to it. Yeah, recommend it. Fantastic. Well, that there we go, bird nerds. Perhaps a pathway for some further study to satisfy your itch, if that is what you're in- interested in doing. I I have no idea how I would use a qualification in ornithology at my at my well, stage look, of many, life, David. For many, it's not about the qualification; it's about the formal structure, the learning. Um, so we've got yeah. plenty of people. Yeah, we've got plenty of people, professionals who are into birds from a variety of ways. They're wildlife carers. They work in a wildlife agency, they're doing a particular thing as a consultant, but they recognize, look, they know stuff, but they want it. They want a grounding. They want a formal sit down, pay attention. This is the basics. This is the framework to slot in what they already know. And then to give them kind of structure to then start adding uh, new knowledge to that. But if it's not your jam, fine, but just if it's something you've been considering, it's well worth exploring. Yeah, I, I was just pleased to see something like that turn Ooh. up, really. I think it's it's really good that it has that flexible approach to letting letting people develop their skills. Funnily enough, David, before we get into the bioacoustic side of the chat, I spoke to Ricky Coglin a few days ago, and she's just launching a course in birdwatching, which is obviously not, a, not an accredited or c- certificated 
kind of course, but it's aimed at helping people get their game when it comes to morphology and then placing maybe target species and whatnot into their ecological environmental niches to help you be more effective when you get out there with your scope or your binoculars and and whatnot. Yeah, it's kind of good. I wish I kind of wish no, that around with as Rick, Ricky was a former student in the birdie course that we teach. So I remember Ricky from way back. So I, I wish her all the best for that. And I think that'll be a great way for people to, yeah, just for, for looking to take their interest just a, a bit further. So well worth pursuing. Of course, people will be able to listen to the chat that I had with Ricky. Ricky was the warden at the Broome Bird Observatory, among other things. So she's uh, mm. a, lot of, a lot of practical knowledge and can handle tourists. Oh, she's one of those embarrassingly talented people. She's an amazing artist. She's really great at taking quite complicated ideas and conveying them visually in a really accessible way. So you don't even know you're learning. It's a gift. So there you go, Ricky. We've, I don't know if we've pumped up your tyres enough, but there you go. So tell me about the reason that I that I chased you up. This paper that you, that you put out, first, what was the idea in in... in in pursuing or deciding to publish the paper? So the idea was born from a researcher working with me, Liz. She's a postdoctoral researcher working on wetland birds, rails, bit sneaky things. And she's pioneered the use of camera traps to detect them. Now, you often think of camera traps, those motion-triggered cameras, as things that mammal people use to see bandicoots or tassie devils or whatever. And they're originally designed for hunting, for deer hunters in the US to find out where their deer, where deer go on their property or in the spots that they like to visit. And Liz pioneered the use of that tech and then acoustics to find these really sneaky birds. And she's been working with me for a few years. She had the idea originally, it's like, hey, seabird people have been using acoustic lures for a while. So there's an island, it's offshore, it might have rats or cats or whatever on it. You deal with that threat, you get rid of the threat, but then you need to tell the birds, their puffins or she orders or petrels, whatever they are, it's safe. It's okay. Come to my party. Come to my party. Come back. And so you broadcast the call of that one species. And that's been done for years. It works well. Aquatic people do this. Whale with whale calls, dolphins and stuff. Both to come here or stay away. There's a fishing net. There's, you could get snarled on something. But her idea was, hey, what about doing this at the community scale? What about doing this with everything? Because the data we're collecting, with, with the collaborative work we're doing on wetland birds, but also the broader work I'm doing with the Australian Acoustic Observatory, where we've got about 200 machines around Australia right now recording everything 24 7. So we've got oodles of data on what places sound like. And that's a storehouse of information that we could use. A fire rips through, a storm rips through, something bad happened. Can we use that whole of system recording, what we call a soundscape, to tell frogs, bats, Birds, cicadas. Yeah, come back. And also things that don't necessarily vocalise but do hear other sounds. So it's like, oh, that sounds like a pretty productive wetland. I'm going to go and check that out. Can we use that to fast track recolonisation? So that's where it started. And then the more we thought about it, it's like, hey, this is actually pretty doable. It's pretty cheap. You can go to JCAR and get what you need to do this. Yeah. But there's lots of value adding that would come from this the more you think about it. So it's really just saying, hey, acoustics is being talked about a lot as a monitoring method as a way to find out who's here, who's around, and more powerfully, who's not here, let's turn that around. Let's turn that around and use this storehouse of recordings we've got, make mixtapes, play them, and see if we can fast-track recolonisation. I love that. The the Habitat mixtape. The best of. The Reclaim Marsh mixtape. I can just see that, that being a chart top of day. I'm pretty on top of what's going on. I'm always reading and following up things on Twitter and whatnot. Why did I not know about the, what did you call it? The Bioacoustic Observatory or whatever. What? No, no, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. You haven't got top of everything. It's a project. It's a project. I'm, it's not my baby. I'm one of I'm one of a bunch of researchers that have been working on this for the past five years or so. So yeah, just Google Acoustic Observatory and you'll get right there and you'll find out more about it. It's all open access. All the data is online. So you can listen to uh, a top end wetland. You can listen to a North Queensland savanna woodland. You can listen to Truana, a really isolated island in the Ferno Group in Bass Strait that you can hear what it sounds like. So it, is that a, colla- a, a formal collaboration between universities or is it a loose yeah. collaboration between individual? Re- it is a formal 
It's a formal collaboration between James Cook Uni, University of Queensland, University of Queensland University of Technology, University of New England, and us, CSU, researchers of all those institutions. So we we big borrowed and demanded some money from our institutions. We then yep. went to the feds and said, Oi, how about you how about you you match that? And we bought a bunch of tech and got it all over Australia right now, recording and storing that data. There's a lot of the things we want to be able to do with acoustics. It's just over the horizon in terms of the tech to detect individual species, to do really fancy uh, broad-scale analyses. Some of that we're doing now, but a lot of it we want to be able to do. We need to get the skills, we need to train people, and we need to start recording now. So we've got this, this benchmark data sitting there, archived, ready to go. Now, when I spoke to Alini about her Seabird Soundscapes project, mo- well, a large part of the analysis that she was doing for ID and then separating what the calls were once she'd got down to a species level, what the actual calls meant, was being done by AI. Is is the your project focusing mostly on AI or are you bringing yes, the that- tapes home on the weekend and going, sorry, dear, can't have dinner. I'm listening to Kakadu. So the size of this endeavour is rather large. So these machines are pulling in about a gig of data a day and 15 years worth of this data set will be the size of the entire internet 15 years ago. So 15 is the magic number there. So no, way more than any human, an army of humans can listen to. So it, the trick is to train computers to do stuff. But in order to do that, you need massive call libraries, annotated call libraries. That's what this is. And that's what this isn't to train a computer so it can start to recognize these quite complicated signatures. That's one of the many things we're doing with this data, but really our role in this is more as curators to say, look, let's get it together, let's get the data together, and let's make it available to anybody to do whatever it is that they want. This could be artists, this could be school teachers, this could be environmental monitoring, many things. And I'm guessing there's an opportunity for volunteers to assist with identifying things that maybe the computers haven't tagged yet. Because Indeed. That's the challenge with many acoustic projects is to get that tags done. And that there's no two ways about it. That requires lots of person hours. And depending on what it is, sometimes that's a person with a lot of experience. But our hoot detective little trial downs. That's just listen to nighttime calls, hear an owl, and put a box around it. That's an owl. Not even sure what owl it is. That's fine. Yep. That's still then- telling a computer right there. And that's right. And then you can send that file out to the 20 our researchers that you know and say which one is this and what is it doing and to build the database up yeah it's really exciting and it's a well it's really the only way to make use effectively within the budgets that you're all working on or working with to achieve big outcomes isn't it because yeah look that's the unfortunate thing and i think there's a lot of really worthy outreach and engagement that goes on under the citizen science banner. But there's also a lot of higher ups, certainly in government right now, see citizen science as just cheap. As a way to not spend money. That's right. As a way to not what? spend money. Exactly. Why should we give Dave any more money next year? Because we've got 50,000 people in their lounge rooms doing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the best citizen science approaches are married, those two valuable partners of scientists doing cool stuff and a whole lot of people interested in doing cool stuff and with a variety of skill sets but contributing and together great things can happen yeah and i'm pretty sure if we interrogate the if we were able to interrogate the data about who the citizen scientists are i reckon that 50 percent of them would be people who are scientists who are further volunteering their time there's been a fair bit written about that too so especially in a plant world People finding rare plants, people describing new plants, they're mostly on the other side of 60 and not necessarily employed anymore. And it, it's a problem. So it's these are engaged people. They're happy to give their time. I'm not feeding up orchid enthusiasts at all. But that is not a sustainable situation. In 30 no. years, no. who's going to be doing that work? Because we're not training those people right now. That's right. That's a really... And the other, extending that even further, Dave, is that... You and Maggie, who turned girl for people on Twitter, who has contributed to the show before. I'm sure that when you're not doing your allotted hours of work, 
that you and people like you, using your skills as scientists, are contributing to citizen mm. science projects in, in, in your own way. So the point I was really making is that if there's 50,000 citizen scientists working on a project, I reckon that 10,000 to 20,000 of them are people with qualifications and skills who may be employed as scientists somewhere else. So it's not like there's an army of me and my neighbours doing all the work. It's still leaning on free work from people who are not being given $40,000 for a project. They're being given $15,000 for a project. Indeed. But so, especially, I call aside a side eye. We are in two edges. Now, it's all. Can you hear me? I can now. We have to just acknowledge the fantastic contribution to to the Australian communal life that Malcolm Turnbull made with the NBN and might get you to try and restate that, David, because I lost it. I'm pretty sure everyone else did. So you started with the scientists that you know, and I'm sure there's a lot of them. Yeah, so the point I was making is that we do it for love. We do it for love, and we spend a lot of our time doing this kind of stuff outside of hours just because we love contributing. We love learning. Yeah. And, but it's not a sustainable way to to develop a scientific community, is it? No, it's not. And it, it's got problems because it favours those people who can afford to work for free. And that, yep. a lot of people are excluded, and that's a huge problem. Yeah, and it kind of defeats the the popular view about what citizen science is. Like it's, it's Bingo. promoted. Bingo. It's a promoted in a way of sharing knowledge and promoting access. But, mm. yeah, I'm not going to criticise it, but I am certainly saying, as you are there, that there is some limitations and it's not a, it's not a sustainable approach in, in preference to properly funding universities and the departments that do the work. Uh-huh. Let's have one little bit of political stuff before we dive more into the paper. All right, go for it. Biodiversity is absent from an election campaign at the moment, David. I'm not even it hearing. Is. I'm not even hearing the Greens banging on about it. Why is it? Is it, do you think it's because the community hasn't been trained to latch on to biodiversity as a term in the same way that everyone has latched on to climate change and greenhouse gas? Yeah, it's an issue. I think there was a there was a there was a survey done years ago in New South Wales. And most people interviewed thought biodiversity was a brand of detergent. So just the word is a hurdle right there. Now that's dated and that's a limited data set. So don't read too much into that. But I think I try and avoid the use of the word biodiversity. I talk about wildlife because that's my neighbor knows what that is, but it, call it what but, you want. But, but it's fraud, though. Wildlife. But isn't that fraught, David? Because for instance, I'm it is fraught. Like, I share a house with someone who doesn't have the same passion for me as about birds and plants and whatnot. But noisy miners to him are wildlife, right? If I use sure. the term wildlife. But noisy miners is not about biodiversity in my patch. They're driving out some of the other species. So even though we had the sort of the green election in what was it, 80, 83, the stop the dams and mm, that- whatnot, I mean. As a young student, I was out at all the protests and whatnot, but I don't see activists in the streets anymore. Of course, not during COVID, but even in, I reckon, in the last six, seven, eight years, I think we've had sort of refugee protests in Melbourne, but I'm, I haven't seen anyone sort of going sweet you know, parent, crisis. Of honey eaters. Extinction crisis is a group that's really latched onto this, and but they... They make them, they make a lot of enemies. They necessarily disrupt and that turns a lot of people off. I think it's tricky territory. And I think many people are struggling. They're struggling with health. They're struggling with financial stress. They're struggling with a lot of pressing issues that are affecting them daily. And I'm certainly sensitive to about that when I'm trying to engage the broader community with some esoteric bird or some rare orchid or whatever it is that it's, I don't want to add to their stresses. But also want to let them know that there are some genuinely quite straightforward things that they can do to help out that little bird, that little orchid, and who they vote for is close to top of that list. Yeah. And was it yesterday that the report came out? I just saw it in my feed yesterday about the contribution that bird tourism, bird watching tourism, mm. 
made to the economy. Now, that that's great. That's valid and everything. But why are we not making tourism bodies bang on about conservation? We're getting there. So we're getting there. And I think avi tourism, as it's called, it's got a word now. So bird-related tourism is most definitely growing. And I think ecotourism, call it what you want. There's problems with some of these terms. But nature-focused tourism is going off the charts. Yep. And I think travel, who knows what international travel is going to look like in the next four or five years. But even domestically, just traveling around wherever it is that you live, but to some greener spots to look for nature, to engage with nature in a in whatever way that you want. More and more people are seeking that out. And yeah, we don't really hear about it, but that's not to say that isn't occurring a lot. Yeah, I just, I just think we need more industries that have got clout to become allies in this fight. Because for, forestry's got enormous clout, but it doesn't have it doesn't have the numbers of people involved, individuals involved, <laughs> as tourism does. Very true, very true, uh, very true. Tiny numbers in forest. And although people go, well, does it really matter if we lose the swift parrot or the region honey eater? Well, maybe on a global sense, you could say, well, no, but it's going to bloody hurt if we lose the koala. And if we keep doing the things that mean we're going to lose the region honey eater and the swift parrot, we're going to lose the koala. And people think we're being panic merchants, but the decline in the koala population has been staggering. And to think that Victoria is the stronghold. And I used to see koalas frequently when I was young, mm. but I haven't seen mm. a koala in the wild for 20 years, I think. The last time, well, it'd be fi- no, it'd be 15 years. But they used to come to a, pl- a house I lived at, the regular visitors, the male doing his territorial calls and whatnot. But last time I was down there for a couple of weeks, I didn't see any evidence of them, didn't hear any, didn't see any crossing the roads at night, which is a lot of the mm. things that we used to have. With sure. Them. And that was in an area which is still listed as a stronghold. Who's going to, I mean, people are going to make the choices. Go to Africa, see elephants and antelopes or go to Australia. Oh, they don't have koalas anymore. We won't go. We'll go to Africa. I think that's the, what people are going are gonna to do. And we're so dumb. We're so dumb. Anyway, there we go. My, oh. rant, my rant's over, David. How do you see the future of establishing, repairing? They're all loose terms. Tell me what terms we should be using when we're talking about taking an area that's been denuded and fixing it. Sure. So this is something that that people have been thinking about for a very long time. So broadly, the word is restoration. There's subcategories in that, but I think that's a word that most people can sort of grapple with and get behind. So fixing up, fixing up a place that for whatever series of reasons has lost a lot of the stuff that used to live there before it got buggered up. And for a long time, there's this hypothesis that was formally named much much later than it was actually adopted. It's called the field of dreams, the field of dreams hypothesis. So it was a crappy Kevin Costner movie about baseball and ghosts and stuff. But the one line that sort of lives on after that movie is- Build it and they will come. As God build it and they will come, bingo. And so that that's the implicit sort of axiom that drives a lot of tree planting. A lot of reach is put the trees back and wait and just magically you reach honey eaters, swift parrots, all those things that we worry about will magically find it and use it and it'll be bush once again. And there's many problems to that approach. It does work for some things in some contexts. It doesn't work for a lot of other, you know, a lot of other examples. And Maggie and I wrote a paper about this, about wildlife restoration, about being much more active, about actively. Can you hear me? I can now. I've just got to give, I've just got to say, Malcolm, Malcolm Turnbull, you are a legend, pal. (laughs) Big man, big man. Oh, destroyed, Uh, destroyed a, a nation building project. I mean, for listeners who aren't aware, David lives in regional New South Wales. You're on that side of the border, aren't you? You're, there we are. I, I live in the city. Once upon a time, we had a plan that we all would have been connected with fiber optical to our homes and it would have been world leading. But of course, conservative government. That we needed to save a few dollars, and what they've given us is a steaming turd that can't be polished. So sorry about that, everyone. That imagery, but back to restoration. A lot of restoration historically has been done in a fairly passive and very plant-oriented way. Either just remove the threatened processes if it was previously a mine site, if it was previously I don't know some sort of toxic industrial area, just stop. Stop digging it up. 
stop putting nasty chemicals around. Often that's enough. In many aquatic areas, just remove the pollutants, just stop putting the pollutants in there, things will get better. But there's that many stresses happening to all of our the places where nature still hangs on. We want to try different ways of getting there quicker. Can we stuff up places more rapidly? And are there ways to do that at scale? And that's where we're coming in with sound. We're saying, hey, by broadcasting soundscapes of how this place, this disturbed place, used to sound, or if we don't have that, that historic information, just go down the road there to that good spot. That's kind of best case scenario, how we'd love this disturbed place to to get to. Just record a week or so of that. Just play it straight, play the raw soundscape, or maybe play favourites, play a mixtape of the things that are most of interest, and then just wait. And many organisms use sound as cues to go, oh yes, go over there. You'll have plummets flying over at night. You'll hear them. They're looking for other plovers. They're looking for potential habitat to feed, to raise a family. It's basically co-opting those messaging channels. But then you might say, but wait a minute, Dave. Let's say a fire's gone through. Whole valley is denuded. There is no vegetation. And you're playing tapes. That's misleading advertising. You get bloody A A triple C on you, calling in glossy blacks. There's no food for glossy blacks. How dare you? They're just passing through. They're in the neighborhood. You haven't put them there. They're, they're, they're their own beasties doing their own things. Mm. If the resources are there, they stop. That's right. But here's the cool thing. They'll come by, have a bit of a sniff, have a bit of a cramp, have a scratch, look around, go, no, there's no hollows, there's no she oak cones, I'm out of here. A revolution in human medicine is about our microbiome, about the organisms, the bacteria that's yep. on us, that's yep. in us, having a huge role in in, in in health, in how we how we function, it's exactly the same in nature. And so, a fire goes through an area, the bacteria, the fungi that basically drive productivity in that system, that take organic matter and convert it into things that that living things use. That's sterilized after a fire. That is gone. That's steam cleaned by having a regular, steady stream of just random organisms coming back, saying, "Oh yeah, yeah looks all right." Yeah, but it hasn't got what I need. I'm out of here. You're re-inoculating the environment with bacteria, with fungi, with protozoa, with algae, with seeds coming in on their feathers, their fur, their claws. That is a good thing. That is sort of fast-tracking restoration from the ground up rather than just from the top down of just thinking about the organisms uh, that we see, the big things, the furry things. And then if we think about those big organisms, and let's talk about the uh, the black cockatoo specifically. Perfect. They're long-lived birds, and they have they have memory. We mm. know that. We don't know exactly how they work out where food sources are and when they're moving, but they they will then know if they're familiar with what happens after a fire. I'm assuming that older cockatoos know that oh, there's a fire through here. So in a couple of years, there's going to be lots of she oaks here, or indeed, or serrated banksias or whatever it is sure. so they know all right well by the time junior's a teenager this will be a great spot so they we don't know how their mind maps work but they have them because they had to find new places they do and the idea that we're trotting out as well as birds frogs all the rest of it it's just as appropriate in underwater environments so sound travels really well in in water Freshwater, seawater, if you've got a massive coral bleaching event, there might be ways of encouraging things to come back using hydrophones, using underwater speakers as well. So don't just think terrestrial. This is, in any system, this has merit. Very much. Thanks for your comment, Chris. I appreciate that. I don't know if you saw that, Dave. You just followed up on my on my comment about the what you that which cannot be polished. I'll just pop that up. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Grogan's plenty of those lately. Yeah, exactly. And look, David, I'll just extend an invitation to the people who are watching that if you think there's a question that I haven't got around to asking, or you want to follow up with a comment or something, or tell us about something that's happening in your hood, just stick the comment in there and we'll we'll address it. Unless it's one of those crazy Twitch people who say all kinds of random things, David. So th- this approach... David, is it being used anywhere in Australia now? No, it's not being used anywhere. There's, so people have talked about doing this 
for restoration, but they're just focused on play things and see if things come back. But that's at the species by species level. Nobody's tried this at the community scale and nobody's thought about this in terms of the bacteria, the fungi, the little things. So Liz and I were playing with these ideas, looking for potential grants, looking for potential systems to to try this. And let's look, it's a pretty it's a pretty broad idea. Let's just put it out there first and then let's keep looking for partners. Let's keep looking for systems. So yes, it's a perspective piece at this stage. We don't have any current projects that are doing this on the ground, but this time next year, hopefully, that will be the case. And it, it, it seems to me that there's logical synergies between mm. local government, Greening Australia, Landcare groups. Yes, agreed. Specific conservation groups like Friends Of and whatnot, or, all to get together and work. And one of, the, one of the useful things with sound as well, you can archive it. So a recording can be just popped there on the web. And so let's just say miscellaneous West Australian mine company dot com dot au dug a big hole and then whatever they pulled out of that hole is no longer economical to pull out of that hole. They need and to then, restore that. And then they went broke and didn't do what, the restoration what? and said, You can do it, community. Where would that okay. happen? Where would that ever happen? So let's let's go with they still remain viable because they are wholesome. How at what point do we the community, the common the bear of the holders of the Commonwealth that they have monetized. When do we say, yep, we're happy? You've done a good job. You've restored that to a, to a level that we are happy with. Sound can be a really useful way of quantifying the entire community. The rustle of wind in the tree, the crunch of leg slitter underfoot, the way rain sounds when it comes down after a summer storm. That's all. There are acoustic indices that, that capture that amount of information about us. You can record all of that before a single spade has been turned. You can bank all of that. And one of the terms of granting them the license to dig a big hole in the first place, you're going to get it back to this. And if you don't do that, you're not going to dig holes anymore. So there's ways of doing this in a way that the whole community publicly, in a very transparent way, can, can be involved in that discussion. Yeah. Now, can, you can see the comment there from Chris. Okay. Here we go. Oh, this is even good. But maybe I think Chris is asking for an update on, is that A20 or A20? So A20, that, that, that's the Acoustic Observatory. There we are. Uh, yep. Thank you. So Chris is another member of the International Brotherhood of Watson. So we go way back. So <laughs> th- thanks, Chris. Yes. A20 is going well. And really we're focusing, we're focusing on, on, on the back end of things. We're focusing on getting the data, on archiving the data and on storing the data. There's many things we want to be able to do with it. And the point you've raised there is absolute top of the list. We need to train. We need to train people to navigate large acoustic data sets, to do all sorts of visualization policies underpinning those visualizations. How we train those people, who those people are, how we share that information. I think that needs to be in an online setting and in a very much an open access way so that it's all it can all be seen and shared effectively in real time. Yeah, it's, it's it, no massive nuggets of gold to, to share with you just yet, but it, it's, it is a top priority for our group. So yeah, more to say on that in a year or two. Okay. And so this is very much a long term. We want to do this forever, Grant. This is, we want to do this forever. We've got those machines out there recording now. Those machines will fail. We'll replace them with newer tech that's cheaper and more accurate. We see this as a way of keeping tabs on the environment that is complementary to many other things that we do, but we are committed to this. We see this as a viable way of getting, essentially, once Australia invests in the internet, almost a live feed <laughs> of other things travelling in our systems. My dream for this is to have effectively a stock exchange. Rather than watching a trace of some company that does who knows what, who knows where, you've got a live trace of how a top-end birds are dealing. Oh, have you read about the nectar shortages in, in the Roper River? Yeah, that's a problem. Should start seeing those blue-faced honey eaters move into Darwin in the next three weeks. If you look at so, And that's all with sound. We can do that now. We just need to invest in a way to share and synthesize this torrent of data that we're currently collecting and mostly archiving we're not doing a whole lot of on-the-fly analysis with it. We can do that. It's going to require tens of millions of dollars of investment to, to, to do that kind of thing. So that, that was 
where I was going to go next. Now, we've got universities collaborating in this project, but then for it to become like reality, you need to have local government, state government, and mining bodies and whatnot involved too. Are the local government, how do I phrase this? Are there people in local government who are interested and there are many potential that? I mean, there, there needs to really be a position in local government that focuses on these kind of issues as much there are. as needs of a town planner. Sure, and there are. Many councils have biodiversity types, have an often really talented, hardworking, diligent people doing their level best to hang on to all the good stuff in the area that they, that they look after and sound as much as habitat restoration is uh, elements of that. I think our focus with this project, at least initially, has been engaging with stakeholders who own and manage the places where we've put these machines. So we've dealt with private landholders, we've dealt with non-governmental organisations, and yeah, pastoralists, plenty of agricultural groups uh, are involved. That's where our focus has been. But yeah, to scale this up, it just, it, it needs investment. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do on the cheap, but if we're serious about this, if we actually care about Australian nature, you're going to need to start to spend some proper money, not just little pissy gold coins, actual money, proper money, and, and not and not through some pretend competitive grant system, because no. that's just a waste to the bottom. That just, people like me, we then spend half of our working life chasing money. Is that what you, is that what you want me to do? Is that what you want me to and, do? Because that's what I'm and, currently doing. And that's exactly, Dave, why I get so frustrated and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because you use the phrase there, if we really care. And that is the question that I always want to pose to anybody who is a decision maker and is making, who is allocating funds. But I also put it to anybody who tells me how much they love wildlife or they love animals. Fucking show me. Show me the money, right? Sorry for the French, but it, it, I mean, I'm not even professionally involved in it, David. I can't imagine how frustrating it must be for you and for Chris and looking at bird life and whatnot as well, but because they have to tread lightly to, to get the crumbs that they are given each funding site. Many, many people walk that line and yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. And I think with, Climate, obviously, human-mediated uh, climate change is that takes that absorbs pretty much all the oxygen in public debates about this stuff. Mm. That if you think you, if you try to engage with a, a broader group of people, like what I call Kmart shoppers, everybody about this kind of stuff, climate change is that big and that broad and that scary for even the most engaged people that there's very little left. There's very little left for them to talk about swift. Well, there's very little. It's not something like compassion thing. It's just like they just don't have reserves. And this is all of our. It affects everybody equally in terms of its direct impacts. But it plays a pretty heavy toll on 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 environmental scientists. I mean, we live and breathe this, and so we're we're the walking wounded. We walk around daily, and there's always bad news. Well, it's PTSD, isn't it? And obviously not clinical PTSD. So hey. If you, I'll get some comments about that in down the track, but the point being that there's do, we're always doom scrolling in Twitter and whatnot, and I'm always asking for some good news stories, but there's just few. There's just so few where you can actually say this has been a win. And uh, I don't know, David. I'll just uh, pop Chris's other comment up, and maybe did you see what I just put up before that Chris had asked David? I did, and there's a quick question. A quick answer to that. One of the main costs we've got for, for all of you for this acoustic stuff is just send data around because we send it around on SD cards. So 512 gig SD cards yeah. is the currency we use to move large files around. That and servers, like large air conditioned warehouses full of machines and computers. That's where we're spending most of the money that we've squandered. We've, we've squandered, we've put us a Freudian slip. Most of the money that we've managed to, to get together is on storage, is on data storage. And we're at capacity now. We know that many people are sitting on gold mines of additional acoustic data, both coming in now from, from sensors, but also sometimes historic stuff. And that is, we want to grandfather that in. We want to have one go-to, and it's a museum. 
the way of thinking about this is as a museum with a curator and a collections manager and an acquisitions policy and a way of dealing with the sound as if it was a specimen with a tag tied to its leg. That's where we're going. Investment, you know, whether Elon Musk, I don't, whoever, if there's, and I, there is money, there is significant philanthropic interest in the, the sort of tech environment space. This is doable. This is not pie in the sky stuff. This is all very doable. Now, let me put something controversial out there again, David. And Chris, I'd be interested in your thoughts about this too and anyone else watching. If you're one of these people that's fringing around with cryptocurrency, the computer power that is required to make your little bloody playthings and your NFTs is what's being denied to people like David to do real projects, saving real assets and this kind of rubbish. And these are the choices that we all have to make. Real estate in server farms and everything is really valuable. And at the moment, it's being used to mint bloody gorillas that Paris Hilton is is promoting and not being offered a discount rate to institutions that people like David and Chris are affiliated with trying to actually do stuff that that you can experience real world stuff. So please, my plea is always think about the choices you make every day. And there we go. Sorry to be a Debbie Downer, but that's really one of the reasons why computing power is hard to get is mm, because it it's is. minting bloody cryptocurrency. There we go. Not that I'm against Elon Musk throwing billions of dollars your way at all though, Dave. I would love to see it. Good to know. Chris, I'm assuming Chris is still watching. Are you working on anything in particular, Chris, at the moment that you would like to share with us? Because if you are, perhaps if you put your email address in the in the comments, I'll send you the link and you can jump in. And I'm sure Dave doesn't mind another Watson crashing his party if we've got something that we not at all that we can share. I'm really interested, Dave, in how you would still see. Oh, there we go. Chris has got a, I'll pop that one up. There we are. Sometimes <laughs> that's another problem, isn't it, David? In, in conservation generally, that if it's not open access, not everyone can benefit from the work that, that people are doing that might actually be significant and can contribute to the greater good. Very true. Yeah. If it's not open access, if it's in language, languages other than English, there's gold mines of information in PhD and honors theses just sitting on library shelves that doesn't see the light of day. There are many of the ways that we do science now is ridiculously inefficient. I'm gonna I'm gonna get another hobby horse out here because well, we're p- particularly talking about re-establishing habitat. I get annoyed with the fact that we're still destroying habitat. Now that's a whole different issue, right? That's a whole different issue, and that we need to get on top of that. But I get frustrated with the institutions which are largely, almost totally publicly funded, being complicit in a lot of the uh, a lot of the problems and the problematic habits that we are that we are getting into. For instance, no one from Melbourne Zoo will speak to me. Now they're getting involved in captive breeding projects, but as probably the flagship conservation body in the city of Melbourne they're not exercising, putting any pressure on anybody to stop habitat destruction. They will, it will be hidden in stuff on their websites and whatnot. But why I get really annoyed when I see people will be at the photo opportunities with the minister for releasing some. Well, as, as Chris mentioned, it is like, I'd like love to tell you, but it's all under cloud yeah. privilege. Yeah. Many public institutions and the people who work at those institutions, at least one hand is tied behind their back. And so for Melbourne Zoom. Which is a big problem though, isn't it? Because it is. Because, but, but I, I just want to finish. I just want to finish the point. Go ahead. Because I'm someone who cares deeply and will do things and will be involved and will put my time into doing stuff. If you've got the minister there and three television networks and the radio networks and the daily newspapers, why is the minister not put on the spot saying, but aren't we cutting down all the trees still? Just put them in an uncomfortable situation and get the question out there with the small chance that it will make the news. Not the fact that, isn't it great, we've bred 250 birds or we've 50 birds or five birds or however many, 2,000 birds, and they piss off into the ether and they've got nowhere to go, right? To me, it just seems like it's... It's ridiculous, but it's good PR, right? It's 
it's good PR, and that's what annoys me. Yeah, yeah. Fair, fair, fair. <laughs> oh, good. I thought I was just being grumpy old man. What? So how do we broach – or how do we overcome that? Not broach it. I broach it all the time. How do we get to this point where you're chasing grant money all the time just to keep being able to do work, even though you're employed at a university, right? Correct. Interested in your comments too, Chris, and anybody else who is on board. What's something that we can actually do to get past this situation that we've been repeating for 20 years? Where and we're, Don't not vote. we're not Don't vote. Conservative. Don't vote for conservatives who see who see small governments, which is code for giving an increasing chunk of a taxpayer's money to their favoured friends. That's don't do that. So many things become possible once you don't have a conservative government. So that's one tangible thing that you can do very soon. Yeah. And if you from overseas, we're in election season in Australia, so we're all kind of head up about it. It's our one chance in in three years to maybe make a difference. Are there any examples where we're winning the battle? The PR seems to be that we might be winning the battle with the orange-bellied parrot, but have we got any other cases where we can say we're clearly winning? A qual- are we winning with quals? Are we winning with numbats? Are we winning with anything? Chris, I'd love your input here. Yeah, all the examples you're raising, I've got red flags popping up going, yeah, that's bad. Well, that's no, none of those good news stories. There are good news stories. I think one of the big ones is there's a growing understanding that far, the big bad farmer is actually quietly doing some of the greatest stewardship and management for nature conservation across Australia. They're doing it for free. They often do it at personal cost, I should say, not for free. They don't get anything well, out of it. A- actually, l- let's just tease that out. They're not doing it for free because they have the use of the asset that is required for the wildlife to live. So Indeed. they have a beneficial involvement. They're not Indeed. doing it for free, and I wish we would move away from that. I reckon if you have the exclusive right to occupy and use land, you then we then come back to that issue about you've got the right with the people, but do the animals have a right? Do the does the do all the local species also have a right to some kind of foothold on that land? And that's the thing we never really talk about as a community. We all want to save the animals, but and certainly in my discussions with so I live in a rural area, the are all mostly farmers. And when we talk about just random stuff, they care deeply and about the go out of the sea in the back block about those birds that only come through now and then. They want to know more about stuff. They genuinely care. So that care word that you're talking about, that I think your average rust at all, a uh, lot more about nature conceptually and nature, like actually these critters in this part of the world than, number one, that we give them credit for, and number two, that a lot of what you would deem to be progressive urban dwellers, a lot more. I'd like to see a system where we can ascribe a economic value. To- We've got that. It's paying for carbon. We've got that. But it- no, but but apart from carbon, because that's in that that's in that equation. But I would like to be able to say to a farmer, uh, a landowner. I don't want to say farmer because it but- sometimes sounds pejorative. But, but- to any landowner in the, let's say, the box woodland habitat, because we've been mm-hmm. talking about or the box woodland region, because we've been talking about regents and Swifties using the same kind of habitat, and we say, okay, if you can verify a record, of, let's say five records, feeding records of more than 10, 10 region honeyers on your property over a five-year period, you get a $50,000 bonus from the government. Even better, right. and I'll respect for us. Even better here. Oh, by the way, here's your here's your six Coventry skinks, and here's yep. your yep. you qualify for wildlife that we will actively put back on your place because you're clearly doing a good job. Yep. And what I would like to see, because we're living in a country where we've denuded so much of it to the point where even the traditional agricultural pursuits do not pay a living wage. Indeed. So you can still be a farmer, and dad's a farmer, but mum's the matron at the hospital. 
Whereas 40 years ago, mum didn't have to work. She was at mm. home, right? A- and we've got a whole lot of issues we need to tease out. And a lot of times these same people don't educate their own kids in the community. They send them to other communities to be educated. And a whole lot of issues about the mythology, about local community and all that. I want to smash it all down, Dave. But but I would like to have a situation, if we believe that the wildlife is important, that's the first decision we've all got to take, is that perhaps you can be paid enough to maintain the environment that you live in to, so that's what happens, to wreck it. So that's what happens in most of Western Europe, uh, and that's called subsidies. That's the big, bad European subsidies that underlie... Socialism! Socialism! That's a lot of what that money actually goes to, is to look after some and, little butterfly. And Chris has hit the nail on the head here, because I've lived on farms and properties and whatnot. So if you've got, let's say, a 1,000 hectares, you might only really be producing on 300 hectares. Indeed. That might be where the bulk of your income is produced year after year. So why can't we make some money out of the 700 hectares that is marginal at best and mm-hmm. turn it into habitat. Make it better. It just seems like a no-brainer, and we just aren't. But we- yes, yeah, so because that that those kinds of conversations very rapidly they get to well the indigenous perspective of land where the land owns you, as opposed to the white seller perspective where we pretend that we own the land. And so once once land ownership becomes a thing, then all of these other troubles stem from that. And so I think it really comes down to a much, much deeper question about connection with country. And that's, that gets back to recognition of our First Nations people, that Australia still seems to have some massive blockages oh, ma- about massive, many massive, people yeah. I talked to. Many people I talked to, I mean, completely, to why I'm going, completely cool with that. It's like, well, I can't believe we haven't done this yet. But as a nation, with an election down the, coming, coming at us rapidly, we still don't recognise our First Nations people in the Constitution, the reconciliation debate, I can't believe it's still a debate. Yeah, and and look, again, let's throw this out even further. We still have to come up with the issue as a community about how we live as well. We're in the election mm-hmm. cycle and today interest rates might go up today and everyone's talking about first homeowners, blockages to getting into the housing market, blah, blah, blah. But I'm not hearing anybody advancing the discussion about, hey, actually, the way we carve up land and the way that we're building suburbs and everything is pretty fucking stupid, right? I mean, near me, there's a suburb called Melton and Melton South. Well, they built the houses, but they didn't bloody build anything else. So it's a hellhole, right, in terms of somewhere to live. Nobody aspires to live there because it's a new area, but it's, it's a, it's a, underprivileged area and it's new this is we repeat it over and over and over and over and over and over again and we're not looking at medium density housing so you build a new suburb and make put three times as many people in there but actually invest in infrastructure and make it a nice place to live instead of carving off this tiny little corner of it calling it a park and or shall or having an offset for one of another swear word, the F word, <laughs> I'll use the O word as well. I mean, why aren't we learning, David? <laughs> why aren't we learning? Yeah, well. Chris, I'd be interested in your thoughts about offsets. I mean, when we talk about well, the battle, when we're winning the battle, the battle David, are, we, off, are they ever off. good? No, no. Megan Evans, Martin Merrin, there's some very clever Australian thinkers at the forefront of this internationally. And yeah, too long, didn't read. It's a con. It is a con. Yeah, uh, as and, Chris has and, just put up, scam, which is exactly uh, all their worse than that. I reckon it's theft. That, but, yeah, uh, chapter and verse. Yeah, because people are still defending the system. Are they only people who have a professional benefit from being involved in it? I'm not. Okay. Either that or they're pathologically naive. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I was hoping we'd be able to be lots more positive today, Dave, but... I always want to throw it out there. What? Where are we winning? Are we winning in engagement? Where Where are we winning? Bloody hell. No, we're not winning in engagement, that's for sure. Education? In terms of, let's talk about awareness in schools, kids. Are kids more aware? Like, I'm, I'm glad you're shaking your heads because I reckon that my generation, and I'm assuming your generation, I don't think there's too many years 
between you and me. I reckon we had a really good exposure to natural sciences in primary school and early secondary school. I certainly did in terms of being aware of the problems. I did environment. environmental science was offered to me in year 11. Right. I did marine studies in year 10. We went on excursions to places to hear birds and see birds and yes, so I, the I, 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 sanctuary. I've got three kids, two are at uni and one's in year eight right now. And so I, both my you and know, I pay pretty close attention to their curriculum and what they're learning. They're pretty switched on. They're getting a lot of good stuff at school. That's not representative of all Australians, obviously. Yeah, they've also but got I think, two parents uh, who live and breathe it. So. Yeah, yeah. So they're rusted on. It's tragic. Very true. Yeah, it's. I think awareness is there. I think awareness is there. But I think talking with my students at university now, they feel a crashing despondency that the world that they are moving into is going backwards in every way. Every way for them personally, in terms of home ownership, you've mentioned all that sort of stuff, job security. Security, quality of life, but then in the broader context, in terms of a continent, a fabled continent of Africa, where the largest mammal is going to be the cow. That is foretold. That will happen probably in my lifetime. It's horribly depressing, isn't it? All right. But there's, but there's ways of dealing with this, and they're all very personal, I've written about this, that life will continue. Even if humans did their darndest to try and extinguish oh, life yes, on yes. the planet, we, that it, it could not happen. Humanity is rapidly coming to an end of our, to the end of our tenure, sooner the better for everything else. Um, right. But life will continue. Life will continue. And multicellular life has a greater future than its entire prehistory. So it's all good in the big that's, scheme that, of things. All right, yeah, that's right. And who would have thought that it would have been the best time ever to be a nullist, right? Because the end is nigh. <laughs> yeah, really. Look at that. What Chris has put another good point here that you... We've never had the possibility ever in history to know more than we can now. You can Indeed. know more now if you want to know it. Access to good info has never been greater. That's worth celebrating. I agree, and that's one of the reasons I'm lucky. I can do this. 30 years ago, I never would have been able to give you a, a nudge, Dave, and say, hey, let's have a yak next week and see if we sure. can talk to a few other people. We would have had to go through a tedious process of organising to meet somewhere and you're up there and I'm over here and maybe we would have got together at a conference in October. Sure. Yes. There's, the power of connecting is has never been greater, and that's worldwide. You could be in, in Latvia right now and we'd be having the same chat. So, sure, that is huge. And I think now the need for integrators and synthesizers has never been greater. People who are who across a large subsection of what can be known, what is known, and making links, making predictions, that's, we're reliant on them more and more. Do you want to read that one out, that Chris's comment? Bring in the fire. There is simply no excuse for ignorance now. That's something we should use whole leaders to account. Well, indeed. Yeah, I indeed. Agree. I agree. And I extend it. I think we need to hold our friends, our families, our acquaintances, our workmates, our employers, everybody needs to be put to the test. There was a there was an interesting discussion yesterday between I can't remember it was EDO and, and another lawyer talking about lawyers' ethics and who should you work for as a lawyer. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Uh, as a lawyer, should you make decisions about who you work for, who you represent. And I've got pretty simple views is when you walk out the door to go to work in the morning or not work if you're a pensioner or whatever, but you don't leave your your, your ethics on your the hook yeah. next to your spare keys, right? Sure. But I think over time we've allowed that to happen. You're, oh, well, I know my boss is a complete bastard and is destroying other people's lives, but what can I do? I want a four. I want a four bedroom ha home and two cars. What could I do? I'm sure that. I mean, it's a long line, but it's a, it's a direct same line between people supporting sure. dodgy dodgy regimes. It's just a very long line. I want to pose a question to the two of you that because I'm calling you a participant, Chris, because you've been great with all the comments. This reanimation discussion that seems to be happening. One, is it the biggest wank fest that's ever ha ever been had in the world, or is there is there some good that can come from people wasting their time thinking about bringing back the paradise parrot? Okay, okay. Uh, where will I bloody live? That's the okay. Other. So I've thought about this a bit. 
as you might imagine. So I think it's a fool's errand. It's it's a pipe dream. So many things would have to work out just right for it to have an ice cube's chance in Hades to, to get off the ground. It would require very long-term investment, substantial investment, and some of that would be new money. Some of that would be money that is just dedicated to that. So I think the argument of, oh, what could you do with that money? That doesn't necessarily work for all of that money. So the counterfactual there is, yes, you could have saved Habitat, but some of that money only appeared for the Hail Mary shot of getting a thylacine or a Paradise well, Parrot back. But, but can't, you, can't you see the situation where we'll rename the thylacine the Twigathene? Can't you see that being possible, that some someone with an It'll ego and, and, It'll never and, and a... So the, the amount of biology that involves to, to get one individual thylacine as a living, breathing organism, that is it's right at the limits of what we can do now. It would require a monumental effort. But to get an actual population of organisms, that's... Yeah, it's lunacy, that's, isn't it? That's like setting up a Martian colony. It, that would require so much stuff. It is potentially possible, but really... And I guess the biggest thing for me is, as an ecologist, extinction is final. Once something is extinct, it is extinct. And if you even pretend that there's the possibility then you can just use your magic eraser and take it from the extinct pile and then magic it back into the reanimated woolly mammoth paradise parrot we've made it. It's all so you continue you can continue to dig holes. You can continue to blitz what's left of grasslands around Melbourne. Because ah it's golden sun moth, just magic them back. They've done it with mammoths. So I think that is such a dangerous box to even acknowledge, let alone to open and peer inside. <laughs> Uh, but uh, my fear is that it's the old squirrel tactic that it's making us look somewhere else, and that so- it's a bit like talking about transgender issues in an election. It's like yeah. just keep them talking, get them distracted, and ruin a whole lot of worthy people's lives. We're just trash talking them in the public sphere again. It's like bloody hell, really. But there are enough people with enough money. And big enough egos to think that they are doing good works, forgetting that. There's a lot of that. There is a lot of that. And I think it's, there is a responsibility with personally, as well as my colleagues, to really engage with those sorts of people and those sorts of sums of money. There are really significant things that can be done with modest sums of money. Let's focus on that. Let's focus on that. And there's organizations doing that, NGOs doing just that right now. And so, they, to me, they show a pass. And a lot of that is about protecting land, about putting covenants on it, looking after it, making it better. I think uh, Chris hit the nail on the, on the head with that comment. Focus on what we still have. Forget the sciencey party tricks. I think that's, I think that's spot on. I mean, the frustrating thing, whenever they talk about this rubbish and even, I mean, I'm a supporter in general of captive breeding and everything we can possibly do. But if you don't do the genetic work to support captive breeding, I would say, why are we doing it? But the most important thing is, if we're not planning reintroductions, or as Chris said, translocations, into really good habitat where they have a chance to exist into the future, not just for the photo op for the minister, it's... Yeah, maybe. But then, sure. But then I guess one of the, one of the counter arguments to that is, but what about let's say, a schoolgirl now who's six. And on the weekend coming up, she's going to go with her family to Melbourne Zoo and she's going to see a tiger Yep, at close range. She is going to see it yawn and that is going to change her entire worldview when she becomes the CEO of a company that doesn't exist now. That impressionable moment on her six-year-old self will drive her to make decisions and sculpt her values that will make sure the tigers never go extinct in the wild. I, that is I'm, possible. That is not I, a pipe dream. No, I, but I think we're... But that, mean, that, that means your value yeah. needs to be sufficiently flexible that you can allow that individual tiger to have a terrible existence. Yep, but that individual tiger is, is a symbol for, I don't know, what did we... What are there, eight different kinds of tigers? Okay. Well, but the chance the, of when that six-year-old is thirty, the likelihood is that there'll only be two, and that's because we're not doing anything now 
and that every time we eat something that we bought in a box at the supermarket, we've contributed to that because of the reliance on crap like Fine. oil. You could come so, back to me and say that there's been six-year-old girls seeing tigers in zoos for the last century. For 150 if, years, yeah. If they haven't fixed it now, are they ever going to? So it's we can go round and around. Yeah, no, uh, and that's really why I asked the question about are we winning? Like, because we've got the awareness and we've got the most a- access to knowledge and we all know about Extinction Rebellion and the crisis and biodiversity. But here we are, 2022, we're in a national election and... I'm not hearing anyone talking about biodiversity loss. No, it wasn't the last election. It was an election before that. A colleague at work, we were commiserating because the, the bad guys won. And he reflected over his cup of tea and said, I don't think anybody I've voted for in my entire life has ever won. And I had to agree. That's who we are. That's who we are. I was on the Rudd train. I didn't vote in the Hawke election. I think I put this out there on Twitter the other day. And actually, I'll just interrupt that thought. More tigers in captivity just in Texas and there are left in the rest of the world. And look, if we talk about birds, there's a, there's the example in Germany. The A lot of the genetic pool for a lot of the threatened parrots in the world are held in one private collection in Germany, which is, which is nuts. We shouldn't. But... I was at school when John Cain won in Victoria, when Bob Hawke won nationally. I voted for Gillard and Rudd. But we, apart from some of the stuff Hawke and Keating did, nothing's been transformational. And certainly in conservation, even with Garrett as environment minister, a louder voice there has never been for conservation. But you still got to, you've still got to beat the vested interests and that means the whole community have to be on board, and maybe we're winning with the with the orange-bellied parrot. But only, but if we win with that, it's only because at, nobody wants to build much more on where they are living. But if they're yeah, woodland look, species, they're, it's the longest story, the orange-bellied parrot, the decline was happening even before white people got here. Yeah, yeah. So they might just be doomed anyway. Gee, I reckon we've. What do we need? round off with about soundscapes dave what can people do well okay so, uh, yeah. to round it off let's bring it back home I, and it's one of the points you make in the paper so read the paper it's a short it's a short paper it's uh, you'll read it in like 40 minutes yeah, um, and they'll be a link on my on the site they're they're on the are engaging so when you start talking to people of any age about nature oh yeah there'll be a link to sound There'll be a link to the sound of magpies in the morning. When I wasn't living in Australia, I really missed not hearing the currawongs coming in the evening. Sounds. Sounds are evocative. Sounds are, they're close to our heart. And so by using sound in this way, not only are there some genuine things we can do, some improvements to make in terms of restoration, I think it is a real way of connecting people with country and what country sounds like in a way at scale that I find really exciting and is, give, is going to give people who live outside of places they care about, as well as people who live within places they care about, but are, for whatever reason, less able to engage with it directly. I think that is going to be an untapped gold mine of enthusiastic individuals that's, that helps me get up in the morning. Great. Can people contribute recordings? Down the road, yes. We need money to keep the lights on in those server factories. So we're not able to take our recordings freely. Yes, because we can't store them, archive them, back them up, share them. That is not cost neutral for us, but it is a priority for us. We want to be able to be in that position. Is there a facility for people to support financially the project as a whole? The acoustic observatory? So there is for the wetlands acoustic work. There's most definitely that's. We've attracted philanthropic support for that. That's all based on philanthropic support. So there are ways to to support that directly. The bigger, broader push for acoustics, no, that's something that's on us. We need to chase those resources down ourselves. I'm happy to I'm happy to do that. But we're not very good at asking for money from citizens. Oh. And I don't think that's I don't think that's I don't no, want no. That money. I want that's yeah. No, I, it, it's a double edged sword the way I see it because it's the responsibility of governments to do this. Right? It's not the responsibility of my of the Tran family next door to me to be giving thirty dollars to Dr. Know. Dave exactly. and forty dollars to the exactly. children's hospital. And again, we, but we're being habituated into this bullshit again the way I oh, yes. that 
we're, we're being habituated into, oh, isn't it great? Dave's got $20,000 to support another HD student to do something that the conservation department isn't doing because it's too busy worrying about planning issues. Right. I mean, for crying yeah. out loud, why have we got conservation or environment departments in the same department as a planning department? Fuck. That's mm. stupid. What's Chris? Here's a <laughs> comment from Chris. People love learning more about bioacoustics. It's a great way of expanding our appreciation nature to an underappreciated under sense. I agree. Zeno Cantor, no yeah, better great. resource if you're a bird nerd. It? Actually, it's the second best resource on the internet for bird nerds. Thebirdemergency.com is the <laughs> number one. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, but Zeno Cantor is, is great. I'm, do you use some of those sort of archives? that are out creative commons to inform the identification of, of calls and whatnot? Oh, yes. Uh, and so, yeah. No, no, Zeno Cantor in particular. But the tricky thing is that they're often not the kinds of recordings you need to use for a computer because they're lovely, they're clean, they're just that little chipper, yeah. and there it is. We want a computer to be able to deal with crappy noise, car along in the foreground, traffic, a cow, because that's the recordings we get. So we need to train computers to do those filters that you and I do without even thinking about it. Fascinating, fascinating subject. I'm sorry, everybody, for waffling on so much, but it's it's just a concept that we that we need to continue to focus on. Dave, if you were to tell someone the most positive thing they could do for the environment in the next month, what would you tell them to do? Vote for an individual who has demonstrated the they champion evidence-based policy and they care about the Australian environment. That's the one thing you can do. Thank you so much for taking that hook so readily, Dave. Yeah. And look, not only if you're in Australia, that's common for everywhere where you live. You need to take some personal responsibility for all the choices that, that you make. And if you're like me and you care about birds and you care about plants and you care about animal, you need to exercise all of the influence that you possibly can on your friends, your neighbours, your family, your everybody, because we only get one dip at it. And if we don't win this time, who knows what will be left to save in the next election cycle. Thanks, Chris, for your kind words. It's been a great pleasure for me to meet Dave. I've been following his exploits with his aquarium. If you haven't checked out Dave's ongoing project, the biggest private aquarium in New South Wales, I would reckon. Oh, uh, I doubt. And the woodworking projects. And, of course, Dave's also been popping out the, I'll call it the What Bird Is That series. I love that you oh. can just be walking around your property, Dave, and, oh, look, there we go. There. <laughs> that's it. That's how it's done. That's the magic. Yeah, thanks for your input, Chris, and for everyone else that's been watching. I hope you've got some some value out of it. Sorry for the rants again, everyone, but hey, let's let's get out there and just save birds would be my... Uh, look forward to catching up with you at some other time, Dave. I'm sure we can find a... Excellent. Uh, actually, what before we do jump off, what other pro projects have you been working on recently? What? Oh, fair few. Sandalwood has been occupying my mind a fair bit in WA. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one I do want to talk to you on a separate... Yeah, uh, uh, and also this is various to talk mistletoe related projects. So lots of mistletoe things on the go. Some cool papers coming out there. Yeah, and a lot in the acoustic space of using sound in all sorts of ways and then verifying that what you hear is actually a good representation of what's actually there because that's not always the case. And I'm really mindful of, of how much time I've taken, Dave. So I want to run through the bird emergency questions with you at some stage to get to get your take on those, but. You can have a bit of time to do the homework with that and we'll organise a, a, another session to talk maybe a bit more about a particular bird project. Put our thinking hats on, a, on for that. Yeah, thanks, Chris. It's been good to have your input. These sessions are always more fun when the peanut gallery is doing more than throwing <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone. I'm Grant Williams. This has been The Bird Emergency. That's Professor Dave Watson. I can give you the big P, can't I? Charles State University and a champion for the birds. See you later, everyone. Bye.